Hello all and welcome to my Dark Seed series deep dive. This special video is designed to A, talk about two of my favorite games, Dark Seeds 1 and 2, and B, commemorate my 500th video uploaded to YouTube. It's hard to believe I made it to 500, but in any case, before I get started, here's your spoiler warning. I'm going to have an in-depth discussion regarding both Dark Seed 1 and Dark Seed 2, so you've been warned. With that being said, let's grab our ring toss rings, try not to miss, and explain everything from the series. Here, Mike. This will explain everything. Let's do this. Now, the goal of this video is to determine if there is enough evidence to show if the Dark World from both Dark Sea games is real, or if everything is just in Mike's head. I've always assumed that the Dark World was real in the first game, but not in the sequel, mostly due to the ending of Dark Sea 2. As I mentioned in my review of Dark Sea 2, the story is told by an unreliable narrator. I feel like this is especially true in Dark Sea 2, but it's more subtle in Dark Sea 1. Although, having replayed Dark Sea 1 recently, I'm starting to suspect that the Dark World is not real in that game either. Either way, you can't really trust what Mike is seeing or saying, as none of it is truly accurate. You do get glimpses of the truth though by way of messages from the Keeper of the Skulls in Darkseed 1 and Hypnosis Sessions in Darkseed 2. The writer of Darkseed 2, Raymond Benson, is on record with saying that the ending of that game is left intentionally ambiguous. The Raymond Benson article is linked in the description if you're interested in taking a look. So video over, right? It may or may not all be in Mikey Boy's head. Well, I want to take it a step further to look at the hints throughout both games to see if there's anything to support that the Dark World is a figment of Mike's imagination. I'm going to tackle this in the following ways. First off, I'm going to discuss the events in Darkseed 1. Then I'll look at specific dialogue and exchanges between characters. And finally, I'll break down my interpretation of those exchanges. And then I'll repeat those steps for Darkseed 2. Before I begin, I'd like to state my hypothesis. The Dark World is entirely in Mike's head. I also believe that whenever Mike is in the Dark World that he's actually interacting with people in the Light World. With that being said, let's take a look at Darkseed 1. I feel like Darkseed 1 is a tougher nut to crack than its sequel, but let's go over the events. Mike buys a house and has a nightmare where an alien embryo is implanted in his head. He takes medicine for the headaches, but that doesn't stop the nightmares. On day 1, the player should have visited the town, the graveyard, and found most of the items in the house. On day 2, Mike visits the Dark World for the first time, gets arrested for grave robbing, steals a cop's gun, and meets the Keeper of the Scrolls. On day 3, Mike investigates the Dark World more, creates a magic hammer, sends the ancient spaceship away, avoids getting arrested, and gets life-saving medicine from the librarian. That's about it in a nutshell. I picked a few plot points to discuss in the Darkseed 1 section. Again, my main hypothesis is that the Dark World doesn't exist at all, and everything that happens in the Dark World actually happens in the Light World. So, with that being said, let's take a look at the events day by day. I'm just be to understand. Day 1 doesn't seem to offer a lot of clues. Unless you take into account desecrating a mausoleum, Mike just seems like a normalish guy exploring a new town. The player can find book entries that describe strange happenings that seem like they're related to what's happening to Mike. But we're not entirely sure if they're really diary entries, like Mike says, or a page from a work of fiction. Day 2 is where more interesting things happen. Mike explores the Dark World house and finds random items littered throughout. Human items, mind you. This is actually an important note for later when I discuss Darkseed 2. Mike is also warned that the police station is heavily tied to the Dark World, and this leads Mike to believe that the cops are being controlled by the Ancients. The player has the option to buy into that theory, but let's look at why the cops are probably not under the control of the Ancients, and Mike actually deserves to get arrested. Multiple times. For one, Mike digs up someone's grave and is arrested because of it, which makes sense. Grave robbing is a crime after all, so it makes sense that Mike would get arrested for that. What doesn't make sense though is that the cops are waiting for Mike as soon as he makes it back to his house from digging, but we'll chalk that up to a neighbor reported him while you know he was digging up the grave. 
The other scenario that Mike deserves to get arrested for is stealing the cop's gun. My theory about that is, when Mike is arrested in the dark world for having the cop's gun, he's actually arrested in the real world, for a second time. Hence why the guard in the Dark World police station says something about his missing gun, and why all the items that the player stores in the prison pillow are still there. If my theory is correct, then that means that Mike committed a third crime by breaking out of jail, and he may have also released another inmate as well. But hey, at least he gets a cool item. Or does he? Dark World items, like the Dark World itself, don't exist, which is why you can only use those items in the Dark World. My guess is that the inmates said the coast is clear and Mike walked out without being noticed. Mike also receives the microfish or microfiche film, as he calls it, from the Keeper of the Scrolls on day two. If my hypothesis is true, then Mike probably received the microfish from the librarian, since the librarian matches up with the location of the uh, Keeper of the Scrolls. Day three has a lot of crazy events that unfold. The cops do show up at Mike's house on the third day because, well, he broke out of jail. The cops do disappear though, either through plot convenience or maybe due to the last thing that Mike does in the Dark World. Remember, Mike repairs the car in his garage enough for the spaceship in the Dark World to fly away, scotch in the gas tank and all. My guess is that when Mike powers the spaceship, he's actually turning the car on, and that the car leaves the garage and distracts the cops long enough for a certain MacGuffin to show up. Once Mike returns from the Dark World, after the spaceship leaves, the librarian shows up to Mike's house with a prescription medicine that has his name on it. This also implies that everything that occurs is due to Mike being off his meds. The things transforming in front of his eyes is another indication of this. The baby doll, the book, hearing voices on the radio or phone, and the librarian transforming in front of his eyes in the light world indicates that he's losing his grip with reality. Obviously, the dark world is a complete loss of reality, but that may be an imaginary world Mike created based off the things that he read throughout his house. Speaking of, the fact that the previous owner had headaches might be what validates Mike's dream as well. To be fair though, the diary entries he finds mentions the ancients, but like I said earlier, we don't know if it's a real diary or a work of fiction. The battery still works. Given the hints I mentioned above, I believe that the dark world in Dark Seed 1 is in Mike's head. Let's do a quick recap. The cops aren't under the controls of the ancients. They want to arrest Dawson because of the various illegal activities that Mike performs throughout the game. The medicine Mike takes every day for his headache is aspirin, but it isn't until the librarian gives him his prescription that he's cured. Granted, the librarian says it's to cure severe headaches though, but I honestly believe this is intentionally misleading as it's more than likely to cure the visions he's been seeing. Lastly, I believe that Mike creates the entire situation around him from what he reads from the diary entries he finds throughout his house. Mike also only performs tasks after reading about them. I get that that's a game design choice, but given all the books he reads ties to the game in some way, I'm choosing to believe that Mike is creating this fictitious world as we play the game. Granted, he has headaches before the game starts, but again, this is attributed to him coming off his medication. He clearly went to the library prior to the beginning of the game, given the librarian has his prescription. Mike only goes into the Tuttle Mausoleum because he read a book about a Tuttle swallowing a key. He also hallucinates about tuning into a radio station, and then hallucinates further when he's in the car in his garage. The things that happen in the game are driven by Mike's delusions and the things that he reads. The biggest thing that leads me to believe that the dark world is not real is the line that the keeper of the scroll says if you answer the phone on the third day. Remember, anything seen in the mirror is not real. Only the mirror itself is real. Things in the mirror are not real, only the mirror itself. I'm obviously taking this very literally. It really drives the fact that everything that happens in the dark world happens in the light world. You can even see this in the intro scene for day two. It shows Mike looking into the mirror and visualizing a dark world version of himself. That says to me that when Mike enters the dark world, his dark world counterpart enters the light world. But given that his dark world counterpart isn't really mentioned, in this game anyway, it's kind of hard to say. Again, it's more subtle than Darkseid 2, but again, given what the Keeper of the Scroll says, Nothing in the mirror is real. Mike only imagines it. Boy, that's smooth. Thanks for coming by, Mike. 
That's all I can think of about Darkseed. I think it does such a great job presenting the story that the player really does have to think about whether or not the strange things are happening or if they're in Mike's head. I now believe that the Dark World doesn't exist, but it did take multiple playthroughs and reading between the lines in order to come to that conclusion. Although it is pretty damning when the game outright says that nothing Mike sees in the Dark World is real. All that said, that's my take on Darkseed 1. Feel free to let me know what you think and if you agree or disagree in the comments below. That being said, let's start on Darkseed 2. Like I mentioned earlier, while Darkseed 1 is fairly subtle with whether or not the Dark World is real or not, aside from the one-liner from the Keeper of the Scrolls on Day 3, Darkseed 2 is not. This analysis may be a bit all over the place given the game is longer, but I'll try to categorize them the best I can. There are hints throughout the game that the Dark World is in Mike's head, some more subtle than others, but the ending is a clear indication that everything is in Mike's head, even if it was supposed to be left ambiguous, but more on that later. One thing is for certain, Mike is more dangerous in this game. He comes off his medication again, creates a split personality, and even murders several people. It's unclear how Jack, Mike's split personality, was created though. I originally assumed that Jack came about to help him cope with what happened in the first game, but that would imply that what happened in Darkseed 1 actually happened. What I really think happened is, whatever visions that Mike saw in Darkseed 1 actually scarred him very deeply. In any case, let's start at the beginning of the game and dive into the first category, the intro and the first dream sequence. When the game begins, we're treated to a cutscene with Mike running down a dark hallway. He hears Rita, his love interest, call out for him and eventually sees her face. Her eyes and mouth seem to melt out of her head. Eventually, Mike reaches the end of the hallway and transforms into a monster, also called the Shapeshifter. When Mike wakes up, you can actually see the world outside of Mike's window change from the dark world to the light world. While it may be a nod to the fact that Mike was dreaming about the dark world, I believe it points to the fact that he actually believed he was there. In addition to that, I believe that every time Mike enters the dark world that he actually switches personalities to Jack. So what that means is, while Mike wanders around in the dark world, that Jack is actually doing things in the light world. After Mike wakes up from his nightmare, he is questioned by Sheriff Butler about the events of the night of Rita's murder. This is where we get our first glimpse of an unreliable narrator in Darkseed 2. Mike says he doesn't remember being with Rita at the banquet, but we know from Dr. Sim's hypnosis session later on that that isn't true. Mike was, in fact, the last person to see Rita alive, except for the killer. The last scene of the first hypnosis dream sequence is Rita alone in the Dark World equivalent of the park. How would Mike know she was there unless he was too? Hank also corroborated that Mike was with Rita on the night of the murder. So that means that Mike either A, lies to the sheriff, which actually does seem to happen a lot, B, has a selective memory, or C, repressed the memories of what happened. Ah! The first dream sequence leads me to my next topic, glimpses of the truth. The player is given glimpses of the truth throughout Darkseed 2, whether it's from the dream sequences or from conversations between Dawson and random characters. Granted, the dialogue can't be entirely accurate given that Dawson is an unreliable narrator, but some of the conversations do seem to give hints that Mike isn't being entirely truthful. Well, if you remember anything, see me down at the station. But your memory had better return by today, or things won't look good for you. I've already described the first hypnosis dream, so I won't do that again. The second dream is also pretty telling. We see Mike flying above some people in the diner while they're having a conversation. The people are Hank, Jimmy, and Melissa. The group discusses two of the red herrings from the plot of Darkseed 2. One is paying Jimmy to do jobs around the town, and the arson and subsequent murder of Mr. Ramirez. The group also mentions something about Rita having a thing for people's husbands. They don't notice Mike until the end of their conversation and get pretty mad that he was eavesdropping. Hank also yells out that Mike's shoes are bleeding before Mike plunges into the river of the dead. 
To break this down, Mike was at the diner when the conversation took place, except as Jack. This also occurred right after the murder given that there was fresh blood on Mike's shoes, hence the comment that Hank makes. Hey Mike! Your shoes are bleeding! I'm not entirely sure what Mike falling into the River of Dead is supposed to signify. Assuming Rita was his first murder, it could be construed as Mike's loss of innocence. But nothing is really subtle about this game, so I'm not really sure. I did forget to mention earlier that we also saw Rita fall into the River of the Dead during Mike's first hypnosis dream sequence. That's a common trope we see throughout the game, dead characters going into the River of the Dead. Granted, you may only see the River of the Dead one more time unless Mike dies a lot. Mike also drops other hints that he knows what happened throughout the game. For instance, when Mike enters the Dark World Park, he makes the following comment. A dead end, in more ways than one. Either he remembers his dream from Dr. Sim's office, or it's an admission of guilt from the murder. There are two moments in Darkseid 2 that I can think of that equate to Darkseid 1's line from the Keeper of the Scrolls about the things in the mirror not being real. When Mike asks one of the Keepers how to find the shapeshifter, they reply, look into your memories. This is a clear indication that whomever he's talking to knows that it's all Mike's head, and that he needs to come to that realization himself. Only by facing your destiny will you know that. You must do it, Michael. Go back to your own world and search. Look hard at everyone you know. Look into your memories. You will find the answer there. The second moment is when Mike gets Pandora's special reading. Mike wonders out loud what could be in his closet, and Pandora replies, You do. Again, characters are pointing out that Mike knows more than he lets on. Another glimpse of the truth can be found in the last encounter with Jack on the porch. Mike thanks Jack for knocking Jimmy out, and Jack replies, No problemo. I had a feeling you'd try to take Jimmy's head off. So, did he fess up? Given that Jack knows about Mike's tendency to remove people's heads after murdering them, it seems like an obvious nod to the truth. Jack, of course, is the same person as Mike, so it makes sense that he would know and even tease Mike about it. There's only one more glimpse of the truth that's really obvious, and that's when Jack tries to prevent Mike from going further when he's in Rita's house. And that's because... The truth can be very ugly. And then we see Jack turn into the shapeshifter, Mike's Dark World counterpart. Speaking of counterparts... Before moving on to the next section, I wanted to take a minute and point out some interesting things I noticed about people's Dark World counterparts. Everyone in the Dark World has a trait that Mike associates with their Light World counterpart. That is, the Dark World reflects Mike's opinion of everyone he talks to in the Light World. For instance, Ick and Ook like to ask riddles, just like Minnie and Daisy. I'm not sure why Mike would use the verb molest instead of bother when talking about them, but that's another story, and actually totally unrelated to anything. But how can I not mention that ridiculous piece of dialogue? I don't think Ick and Uck are going to molest me anymore. The next is the giant baby outside of the Keeper of the Scrolls. The giant baby outside of the Keeper of the Scrolls area is a nod to how Mike perceives Gargan and the way he acts. That is, a big baby. The Keeper of the Scrolls matches up with Pandora in this game. Both characters help guide Mike throughout the game, which is almost a little bit like how the librarian helped Mike in the first game. It's her, the Keeper of the Scrolls. I feel like I should bow, but I'm too embarrassed. The biomechanoid outside of the High Priestess's house prevents Mike from entering, just like the deputy in the Light World. Rita's equivalent in the Dark World is the High Priestess. This is obviously because Mike holds her in such a high regard. Mayor Fleming's Dark World counterpart, the Judge, looks like he's wearing a dunce cap. I feel like Mike doesn't like the Mayor very much. He also describes the Judge as looking like a clown. The Judge also disappears after Mayor Fleming is killed. The gun shop owner is bland and boring, just like Paul Cooper is. There really isn't many similarities between the Dark World Diner guy and Hank that I noticed. Both talk to Mike at length, but they just seem like they're there for exposition. Jimmy and Melissa are shown as junkies in the Dark World. Goth has an exoskeleton for protection, just like Slim has his protective vest. There's no equivalent to Dr. Sims that I can recall, but the Dark World Therapist's office is an area that implants alien embryos into people, just like the day one intro scene from Dark Seed 1. So you can get an idea about what Mike thinks about Dr. Sims and his advice to him. 
Dark World Doc Larson, that's a tongue twister if I've ever heard one, is just as depraved as the Light World version. And as far as I know, there are no equivalent counterparts to Mike's mom, Sheriff Butler, the clown, Mrs. Ramirez, and the carnival barkers. And no, I'm not including the Dark World moms whose head explodes as the Dark World equivalent to Mike's mom. (laughs) Anyway, back to the main topic. So if Hypnosis and other people are telling Mike it's all in his head, then why doesn't he believe any of it? Well, Mike receives a lot of negative reinforcement throughout the game. One might even say, Dark World reinforcement. So Mike really wants to believe in the Dark World. It validates all the things he sees since he's not taking his medication. Mike mentions it to anyone who's willing to listen and not call him out for it. Everyone else, though, tends to get pretty aggravated with how he's acting. That being said, let's discuss some instances where Mike's delusions are reinforced. One of the first instances of reinforcement comes from Mrs. Ramirez. Mrs. Ramirez reinforces the idea of dark forces in the town, especially as it pertains to her late husband. Mike, of course, initially thinks that her dark forces are tied to the dark world, even though he knows deep down that Jimmy caused the fire that killed her husband, you know, since he was listening in on the conversation at the diner. Slim is another character that reinforces the dark world for Mike. In fact, Slim actually foreshadows the entire plot of Darkseed 2. He says evil is hatching, which correlates to the incubating behemoth. The behemoth is supposed to take over the world and spread darkness, which is also what Mike hears later on from the Keepers. I mentioned it earlier, but I'll bring it up again. I believe that events that happen in the dark world may in fact be based on things that people say to Mike at the beginning of the game. I mentioned earlier about the diary entries in Darkseed 1. In this case, it's the characters talking to Mike. For instance, Goth's exoskeleton or protective armor is due to Slim mentioning his armor, and that Rita's book club may actually be a satanic cult. Mike continues to go to Slim because Slim buys into Mike's delusions. Slim reinforces that Rita was killed by other forces, such as Dark Worlders. Mike immediately leaves or ends the conversation as soon as Slim begins to change the narrative to someone else killed Rita. Minnie and Daisy seem to have their own issues, but Mike associates their issues with his own. In fact, I'd say that's why Mike finds a portal to the Dark World in the Mirror Maze. Minnie or Daisy, and I apologize, I don't remember which one, explicitly says that the Mirror Maze was built as a tribute to the voices that the other hears in her head. Mike honestly just assumes that they're Dark World voices. In addition to the other carnival attractions, Mike also seems to believe Pandora whenever it relates to the Dark World nonsense as well. What a bunch of hogwash. I'm leaving. Mike also seems to be cognizant enough to know when to not pull the Dark World card with strangers. All in all, Mike looks for reinforcement of his beliefs in any way he can find it, even from complete strangers. Okay, so that section may have been a bit off topic from the original topic and hypotheses, but I just wanted to establish Mike's motivation as I saw it. Let's get back to the hint and take a look at the third dream. There's a lot to unpack from this third therapy session and dream. Dr. Sims seems more antagonistic towards Mike during this session. I can kind of understand why, given that Mike hasn't really taken any of his therapy sessions seriously and has ignored most of what Dr. Sims said. Mike even stopped taking the medication that Dr. Sims prescribed to him, claiming that they may be placebos. I believe that Mike says that these pills are for headaches as well, but it's probably the same or similar medication from the first game. All that being said, Dr. Sims being antagonistic towards Mike is certainly unprofessional. But enough about the boring part, let's jump into the craziest dream in the game and see what's behind... Hologram number one! Now, this dream is more akin to a fever dream, but it does shed some light on Mike's feelings. Deep down, Mike knows he's really jealous of everyone's relationship with Rita. Wait, should I rephrase that? No, no, I don't think so. The third dream also reinforces Mike killing Rita with his mother's steak knife by showing that ridiculous graphic of the knives going through her head. I'm not entirely sure why Mike dreams about Paul, though. It's not like Mike knew about Paul's relationship with Rita prior to that session, that we know of anyway. Plus, with the way the game is presented after the third hypnosis session, we can't be sure that any of that information is true. 
If Mike killing Paul is real, then it seems like Mike is targeting everyone in the town that thinks he had something to do with the murder. Although, come to think of it, I'm pretty sure Sheriff Butler does mention Paul Cooper explicitly, so yeah, I guess Mike is just targeting everyone in the town that suspects Mike is the murderer. After the hypnosis, Dr. Sims couldn't, or wouldn't, tell us what happened in the third dream. But it's such a fever dream that I honestly don't blame him. However, like I kind of alluded to earlier with what's presented to us in the game, the third dream sequence technically ends at the end of the game so it was more than likely intentionally left vague. Whether the third hypnosis ends when the game says it ends, or goes on until Mike wakes up at the end of the game, the Jack personality was probably talking to Dr. Sims. And like I mentioned earlier when I started the Dark Sea 2 portion of this video, I'm basing this on the fact that I believe every time Mike sleeps or goes to the Dark World, that Jack becomes the dominant personality. That being said, let's talk about Jack. Hey, wake up, Mikey boy! Jack appears to be Mike's closest friend out of everyone in the town. He's full of helpful advice, or at least he thinks he is. Jack does tell Mike to antagonize the cops in order to find dirt on the murder investigation, so he clearly doesn't think things through either. At least Jack tries to comfort Mike when Mike is upset. Jack's main drive is to get the police off Mikey boy's back. He constantly tells Mike to deflect the blame to someone else. It's not just about finding dirt on another person, but also pinning the blame on them as well. In fact, it almost seems like when Mike finds a serious piece of evidence, like Rita's naughty pics in the mayor's car or Doc Larson's little black book, that Jack is there to end that person's life. <laughs> so much for pinning the blame on someone. We also know that Jack overhears various conversation because he tells Mike about events in which Mike supposedly wasn't present for. Like I stated in the glimpses of the truth section, we know that Mike is the one that is actually hearing the conversations based on what the player sees in the second dream sequence. We also know that Mike frequents the diner a lot according to the dialogue from his mother. This is how Jack overheard the deputy talking about the murder. Mike was there in the diner. Speaking of the diner, Hank seems like another person that Mike really trusts. Even though Hank doesn't necessarily want Mike in his diner, he's still willing to listen and talk to him. Hank does bring up Rita a lot though, and Mike does get very angry with him because of it. This is probably why the diner closes up midway through the game. Once Mike obtains the rancid meat thing from the Dark World Diner, the Light World Diner closes. My thought on this is because Hank is killed by Mike's or Jack's hands, and they close the diner to prevent people from finding his dead body. The Dark World section about finding food is just a way to distract Mike from what Jack's really doing. Remember the hypothesis. When Mike is in the Dark World, Jack is the dominant personality in the Light World. We also know that Jack can easily persuade Mike to do things. Jack says that Dr. Sims is a quack and shouldn't be listened to, so Mike doesn't. I don't believe this is actually how dissociative identity disorder works, but this would likely mean that Jack sees Dr. Sims as a threat to his existence. Jack also mentions that he saw Rita with Mayor Fleming. Hence, why he tells Mike to find proof that the mayor is involved in the murder. This means that Mike obviously saw the two together and got jealous of what's going on. As the FBI agent mentions later on, Mike was jealous enough to murder. Now, whether or not the agent was real or just a manifestation of his guilt, well, that's up for debate. Another interesting tidbit about Jack is that he only appears in four spots throughout the game. His primary spot for appearing is at Mike's house. I believe this occurs because Mike is alone and feels safe. No one can see him talking to himself there since his mom is in the kitchen. The second spot is when Jack pops in to punch Jimmy. We know this doesn't really occur since Slim says that Mike punched Jimmy. Mike quote unquote becomes Jack to help him compensate for what Mike can't do. We see Mike get knocked down and this is the catalyst for becoming Jack. The third scene is when Jack appears in the mirror at Rita's house. But that may be part of a dream, so I don't know if I really want to count that in the grand scheme of things. It seems like reality is slightly bursting in on Mike's dream as he gets closer to the truth. <laughs> the last area that we see Jack is in Dr. Sim's office, where he tells Mike that he is the shapeshifter, as well as Mike himself. 
He's become the dominant personality for those final seconds of Mike's life. Jack is an interesting character in the grand scheme of things. Jack's basically the polar opposite of Mike, which makes sense given that Mike subconsciously created him to compensate for what Mike himself lacked. It's still weird to me that Jack's able to communicate and even control Mike to a certain extent, though. Jack inadvertently causes Mike to start digging for clues that leads to their own downfall. Speaking of, let's get the dirt on Mike searching for those clues. See you around, pal. Jack wants Mike to deflect from his current situation. He wants Mike to prove that someone else killed Rita by collecting evidence. Jack says he can't do it, but Mike can. This is because Jack is talking to Mike in his head. Mike tries to use whatever dirt he knows about Doc Larson in order to gain more information about the murder investigation. I only bring this up because we learned something after the dialogue exchange between Mike and Doc Larson, specifically that the eyes and tongue were cut out of Rita's head during the murder. This ties back to the initial dream sequence where we see Rita's floating head and her eyes and tongue melt out of her head. So this reinforces that Mike has repressed the memories of what he did and only remembers them through his dreams. Mike also looks for dirt on the sheriff to get him off his back. Jimmy apparently has dirt on the sheriff, but he's not sharing it. This almost comes off innocently at first, especially on your first playthrough when you're unsure that Mike is the murderer. We know Mike really wants to know Jimmy's dirt because he's trying to get away from the sheriff. The player even sees this when Mike talks to the deputy. He tries to slow down the investigation because he feels like it's moving too quickly. Mike even eventually tries to pin the murders on Jimmy, especially after he finds out that Jimmy is the arsonist. A lot of dirt that Mike finds is in the form of an item to collect. In the next section, I want to take a look at some of the Dark World items that Mike collects. We've talked a lot about Mike and his actions and conversations with various folks, but let's take a look at some of the game mechanics that point to the Dark World not being real. This section will actually discuss items from both Darkseed games. Items from the Dark World don't affect the Light World with the exception of the Ego Massager in Darkseed 2, but more on that later. You can't even get a reading on Dark World items from Pandora. Most of the items that are found in the Dark World of Darkseed 1 are mostly items from the Light World. The only item that is a true Dark World item is the Invisibility Headband, and it's never used outside of the Dark World. Although, I'm not entirely sure if you can use the headband in the light world since you need to use it pretty quickly after receiving it, but it isn't intended to be used in the light world. Darkseed 2 has more dark world items in it that seemingly affect the light world, but I'm going to try to persuade you that that isn't actually the case. First, let's talk about the biomechanical gun and Mike winning at the shooting gallery. The shooting gallery is won by Mike getting lucky and hitting all the targets. How he hits them is questionable, but it certainly isn't with a biomechanical machine gun. While the carnival barker didn't see it happen, Sheriff Butler did, and he didn't mention a machine gun. Mike just got lucky and managed to hit all the ducks. In fact, I'd even say that maybe the biomechanical machine gun gave him the confidence in order to aim the game gun accurately. Mike won the Wheel of Fortune game by cheating. He stuck a magnet to the game on a number of his choosing. Granted, he does this in the dark world, but I just assume he stuck it on the wheel in the light world while Jack became the dominant personality. The ring toss was won by pure luck. I mean, in theory, everyone will get lucky with that game eventually. Unless you want to believe that Mike never wins it, which is also fine as well. Now, what doesn't make sense is magnetizing the pole so that the ring goes around it. If that were the case, the ring would just stick to the pole. Hey, you missed, pal. The only other instance where a Dark World item affects the Light World is the Ego Massager. You can probably chalk this up as a plot hole, but I think there might be another explanation. I believe that, whatever the Ego Massager really is, the Ego Massager actually makes that ridiculous noise when Gargan lifts it. <coughs> laughter is always the best medicine, so I believe Mike gets Gargan to lift this ridiculous device to make Gargan laugh and forget his worries. I mean, it's obvious the strongman can lift it if Mike can, even though Mike was implying that he could lift it and Garden couldn't. I don't know, it's just my two cents. I also want to take a moment and talk about the sword that is in the shapeshifter's room. 
I originally thought that the sword and the butcher's knife were one and the same, but I've changed that opinion since replaying Darkseid 2. I believe that the sword in the shapeshifter's room is actually one of Mike's old fencing swords. You mean you didn't know Mike was a fencer? I mean, how do you think he was able to best a behemoth? Also, if you click on Mike's things in his room, he mentions that he used to fence. I won this fencing trophy during high school. It's been a long time since I've done any fencing. It's been a long time since I've done much of anything. I've gone over the major things that I noted during my playthrough of Darkseed 2. Let's wrap up the Darkseed 2 section with one final topic. What's up with Mike, and did he murder Rita in half the town? Mike shows more signs of paranoia in Darkseed 2, as he believes that everyone is out to get him, including his own mother. Much like his thought process from Darkseed 1, Mike believes that Sheriff Butler and the local police are under the control of the Ancients. Again, the Sheriff is targeting Dawson because Mike is the number one suspect of a murder. Sheriff Butler also makes the comment that killers like to follow their own crimes, which Mike does throughout the game. Mike also thinks that Dr. Sims is giving him placebos instead of helpful medication, and that his mother is constantly on his back for being lazy. Mike's mother also implies that Mike mopes around all day and stares at the walls. This might be due to several factors, but the most likely one is that he's tired from going back and forth between personalities. Mike also seems to have bad reactions when the murder is brought up. He gets angry very quickly, changes the subject to talk about something else, or disassociates from reality like what happened when the news anchor started to speak about the murder. As soon as the anchor starts talking about it, she morphs into the Keeper of the Scrolls. He refuses to bathe in Darkseed 2, but is more than willing to walk all over town to look for evidence to exonerate him. Mike also seems really fixated on the past as well. Maybe he was scared of growing up, causing his mental breakdown in his return to his childhood town? He says a lot of odd things about his former friends too, like what happened to you to a formerly attractive classmate, or that he used to be friends with the local wise guy Jimmy. Now, this attitude doesn't mean that Mike is the killer, but just like Darkseed 1, the game flat out tells you that Mike is the killer. Jack admits to killing the townspeople and that he's also a part of Mike. You're wrong again, Mikey boy. In case you haven't figured it out, I don't exist at all. I'm you, and you are me, and we're all together, get it? <laughs> the only thing that doesn't make sense at this point is Jack calling himself the shapeshifter and mentioning the power generator. However, this is probably Mike attempting to make sense of what's happening. He likes to connect all negative events in his life to the dark world. Mike also comes off as an insanely jealous person when he realizes that so many people dated Rita. It seemed like the I can't have her so nobody can mentality. We see even further evidence of this after Mike kills Paul and reads Rita's letter to her mom. Dear mom, not much happening lately. I went out with Mike Dawson the other night. He's a nice guy, but he has some emotional problems. In fact, he's starting to act like a sick puppy around me and I'm afraid I'm going to hurt him. Why that bitch? She was never really interested in me. She was just toying with me. In a few minutes, I'm off to my reading group meeting across the street at Paul Cooper's house. Now he's somebody I'm really attracted to. Tall, handsome, and good at fixing things around the house. I'm glad I killed that creep. Mike ends up saying that he was glad that he killed Paul. In addition, Rita's head even tells Mike that if jealousy is clouding your mind again, it will lead to your downfall after appearing out of his mom's food. Are you saying that the shapeshifter invited you to the reunion too? Your jealousy is clouding your mind again, Mike. That was always the problem between us, and it will lead to your downfall. Speaking of deaths, let's do a quick recap on how many people Mike killed, what his motivation was, and how I think he did it. First up is Rita. Rita is killed by Mike prior to the game started. As I stated previously, he was jealous that he couldn't have her. He removes her head, eyes, and tongue. I also mentioned before that I believe that Mike killed Hank in the diner. Remember, Hank knows a lot about the investigation, and plus Hank can place Mike, along with his bloody shoes, at the diner on the night of the murder. 
Mike or Jack murders Hank after he gets the moldy food from the Dark World. Mayor Fleming is killed after Mike discovers that he A. had a relationship with Rita and B. quote unquote made Rita take the dirty pictures. Mayor Fleming is killed while Mike is in the Dark World, presumably by Jack. His head was also removed. Doc Larson is killed because of the discovery of his little black book. Doc Larson is killed while Mike is in the Dark World, presumably by Jack. His head was also removed. But hey, at least Rita got a 5 star rating! Paul is killed by accident after Mike breaks into his house. Even Jack admits that he's grasping at straws at that point going after Paul. Although it could be safe to say that Paul was a target because he knew Mike was with Rita during the night of the dance. Given Paul's death happened after the third hypnosis, I'm unsure of whether it truly happened at all. Again, Sheriff Butler does state that Mike killed Paul though, so I guess that's either a plot hole or Jack killed Dr. Sims and Paul and then returned to Dr. Sims' office. I guess Jack would have to get back to where Mike fell asleep as to not raise suspicion. In either case, Mike or Jack stabbed Paul in his house. Slim is killed by Mike because he knew the truth. Slim tells Mike that Mike saved him from Jimmy when we saw Jack do it. Again, this is the unreliable narrator trope. This is what actually leads to Slim dying. He knew too much. Mike kills Slim by making him overdose on pills. Quick fun fact regarding Slim's death. If the player visits Goth after the Jimmy altercation, you'll see that he's as sick as Slim. Mike even has the option to say you don't look well, just like he says with Slim. Goth also mentions that the shapeshifter has the sword and is conveniently in the dark world Mike Dawson's house. That would mean that Slim may have found the murder weapon, which indicates that Mike has another reason for offing Slim. Dr. Sims is killed because he learned the truth about Jack. Jack stabs Dr. Sims. The final person Mike kills is himself. The ending is pretty clear that Mike is murdered, albeit the exact way in which he was killed is up for debate. We see Jack stab him, but that's impossible. My assumption is Mike can't live with the knowledge that he actually murdered anyone. He probably committed suicide after murdering Dr. Sims, just like Sheriff Butler suggests. That's seven people in total that we know about, and all in one day. And let's not forget he also put two men in a coma, assuming the FBI agent wasn't a figment of his fever dream. This also doesn't include Dark World Mom. I'm basing this on the fact that if the player goes back to the Light World after the head pop scene, they'll see that she's completely fine. So we know that Doc Larson and Mayor Fleming were killed in the same way as Rita. The heads were removed after they were killed. We also can assume Paul's head was removed too since we saw it in the generator. So what's really going on with the heads? I have a theory, and that is that Mike hides the heads in his mother's gardens or flower bed. I'm basing this on the fact that the flowers slowly die throughout the game. The flowers are in full bloom at the beginning of the game, but slowly wilt throughout. This seems like a random occurrence, but I believe this is where Mike is storing the heads of his victims. He states that there are bugs crawling all over that area, which makes sense as decomposing bodies would probably attract a lot of insects. Given that dialogue for most areas doesn't change throughout the game, it seems like an obvious conclusion to draw. Plus, you can have a conversation with Mike's mother about it. I tell you, if I had one good hard piece of evidence against you, I'd have you behind bars so fast your head would spin. Alright, I think I've rambled on about these games for long enough. Time to wrap this video up. So is the dark world in Mike's head? I believe so. Given that the first game explicitly states everything is in Mike's head and Jack reinforcing this in the sequel, I think it's safe to say that it's all in Mike's head. Minus the murders. That does seem to happen. Are there subtle hints throughout both games to reinforce this? Yes, in the first game at least. The second game is about as subtle as a brick to the face. But it does try its best. So, at the end of the day, Mikey Boy is a little bit on the crazy side. You thought you had everything pretty much figured out, didn't you, Mikey Boy? So hopefully you found this a bit interesting. I've always wanted to go into detail on the little things players may miss on their first playthrough of these games. In my opinion, both Darkseed games are great games, and I highly recommend them both. I did make a review for each, so if you want to hear more about these games, then check those out. If you're interested, you can find links in the video description. That wraps up today's discussion. Again, I hope you enjoyed it. It's crazy to think I made 500 videos, but here's to another 500. As always, 
Thank you for watching, and no worries, I'm not going to rehash the same joke again. Hey, you missed, pal. <laughs> I know, but at least I get a beautiful set of steak knives for completing this video. Again, thank you for watching.